we've gone over this naturalism, supernaturalism, so often. I, I think the focus, as, as will be apparent, is slightly shifting towards the question of transcendence, which may or may not be more fruitful. But let me start by referring to Friedrich Nietzsche, who is, of course, famous for proclaiming the death of God, and people sometimes see him as one of the founding fathers of atheism, contemporary atheism. But in fact, he was very much not like the knockabout reductionist atheists of today. On the contrary, there's a good case for saying he had a profoundly religious sensibility. As Ken Jeems has pointed out, actually in a paper given last week here in London, um, the death of God, the collapse of religion, is something he foresees but warns with grim foreboding about. He sees it as coinciding with the collapse of humanity itself, the end of being human as we now understand it. Um, Zarathustra, his mouthpiece, proclaims, prophesies, the grim time is coming when the soil of our culture will be exhausted so that nothing will grow. This will be the time of that most contemptible um, creature, the last man. Why contemptible? Why the last man? Because from then on, from that time on, quote, man will no longer launch the arrow of his longing beyond man. Or in the words of um, the untimely meditations written slightly earlier, the human being will have lost the yearning to, quote, be consecrated to something higher than itself. In short, humanity will have ceased to reach for the transcendent. So Nietzsche understands the longing for the transcendent as something etched into our very identity as human beings. Um, yet I think there's a tension at the heart of his outlook, one found in many modern thinkers since, and possibly uh, in, in Fiona's version of um, expansive naturalism. For Nietzsche, at any rate, the hope is that without God we can somehow create meaning and value for ourselves by a purely human act of creative will. He hopes, uh, says somewhere, that we can devise a new narrative in place of what he sees as the worn-out Christian narrative and thus give meaning and value to our lives. Yet in reality, seems to me, the very idea of a narrative power, uh, of a narrative originating in ourselves as a merely human invention would in the end be subversive of, the, uh, of its power to give our lives significance. Um, in fact, in, Nietzsche takes exactly this line elsewhere in the genealogy of morals where um, he says that once we begin to realize our values have an origin in our past history, our past cultural history, then it won't be long before we're able to ask what value do those values themselves possess. It, we'll no longer, in other words, be able to think of those values as having objective authority over us. And, and that's exactly, of course, where Bernard Williams ended up, uh, inspired, of course, by Nietzsche, when he dubbed what he called the morality system a, quote, peculiar institution that we might be better off without. Um, and um, uh, he, he, in effect, said there are no true objective, ex this word external again, there are no external values only internal ones, dependent merely on our, what he called our motiv motivational set, set of motives we happen to have. Um, so this is the problem with the status and authority of morality, what philosophers now call its normativity. Uh, and in my view, it's ultimately the most powerful reason why we need the transcendent. Um, but first, exactly what does this term transcendent mean? Etymologically, transcend, something that goes beyond, as it were, flies beyond the normal boundaries, as Nietzsche's uh, arrow metaphor has it. 
The other common spatial metaphor is vertical. Um, the transcendent is above or higher than ordinary phenomena around us. Um, these metaphors can easily get us into two worlds talk, two worlds in the same, you know, comparable two worlds. Um, the idea of a superior world separate from our own. And I agree with Fiona, that can be very problematic. Though it may be that these spatial metaphors are the only way human beings can configure this idea of the transcendent, and many, or imagine it, and many things which we can understand in some sense, but which we can't conceive of or imagine, an important distinction that Descartes, I think, was one of the first to articulate clearly. Um, so in the imaginative picture Plato deploys, really started all this, I guess, beholding the suprasensible world is like getting completely outside the cave and viewing celestial objects, the sun and the stars, completely, well, they're somehow grander and more real than the objects in the cave beyond the reach of, of us prisoners down here below. <coughs> This two worlds image clearly influences Christianity, um, some strands of which, though not perhaps all, regard heaven, where God and the angels dwell, as a separate realm uh, beyond the cave of the natural world. Now, I don't want to get into Plato. I mean, the interpretation of Plato is a very vexed issue and hinges on whether he really meant to assert that there are two ontologically distinct uh, realms with the forms um, enjoying a higher degree of reality than ordinary mundane objects. Um, but whatever the correct interpretation of Plato, many contemporary philosophers share a strong distaste, or have a strong distaste for the idea of an ontologically separate realm. Though Spinoza, uh, Fiona talking about Spinoza, does seem to support the idea that even in Spinoza, where there's really one world, there's a kind of ontological distinction. I'm not quite sure I fully understand that. But anyway, this distaste for two worlds you can see in John McDowell, avoiding what he calls rampant Platonism, insofar as it posits, quote, a capacity to resonate with structures of reality constituted in utter isolation from anything human. Same anti uh, antipathy manifest in Christine Korsgaard in her dismissal, scornful dismissal of strong ethical realism for supposing that ethical values uh, are real objects that somehow float by or waft by as she puts it. And Derek Parfit, a uh, similar distaste when he insisted that there can be no strange parts of reality. Something he could, you know, a phrase I think he'd only have used if he was kind of inducted into the, um, a certain kind of uh, physicalist paradigm. Um, and that no strange parts of reality thesis forces him to say that although there are indeed genuine irre uh, values, irreducible normative facts, they have, quote, no ontological status. And it's the sort of tension I think one gets into here. Well, can we go along with this distaste for a separate realm and say with Fiona, there's just one world? Or more precisely, this is the key question, can we go along with it and still remain theists of some kind? Um, in his Gifford lectures of 1984-5, Moltmann, the theologian Jürgen Moltmann, uh, declared that God indwells the creature he has made and holds them in life. He went on to reject an antithesis between God and the world that defines God and the world over against one another, end of quote. 
And he cites various theological backing for that, the Jewish idea of Shekinah, um, God dwelling among us, and also the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, where through the power of the Spirit, God himself is present in his creation. Well, I've considerable sympathy for Maltman's and Fiona's aversion to defining God as over against the world. And indeed, in my own work, I've frequently emphasized that our ordinary human experience of the natural and the human world is our principal mode of access to the divine. Uh, the theist sees the world as charged with, with the grandeur of God in Hopkins' famous poem. But I think there's the, the problem, there's still ambiguities in this idea of God in the world or the world as God involving, which is the phrase Fiona frequently uses. Um, I think relevant here is Yitzhak Melamed's recent discussion of the distinction between pantheism and panentheism. Um, Fiona referred to this distinction, which has become quite uh, discussed among theologians, I understand. Um, and I mean, on Melamed's, uh, Melamed's account, uh, pantheism asserts, quote, a symmetric dependence between God and the world of finite things. So the world is in God and God is in the world. Whereas panentheism is an asymmetric dependence. So that all of nature, all the bodies and thoughts comprising the world are in God, but don't exhaust God. It's the end of the reference to Melamed. Um, to, uh, so well, this is Melamed dis discussing um, Spinoza, but I, I don't actually want to get into Spinoza because that's a paper in its own right. Um, but let's just apply that distinction to, for example, the poet Wordsworth. He comes out on that distinction, in my view, as a panentheist, not a pantheist, although he's often called a pantheist, um, because for him, Wordsworth, the beauty and goodness we experience in nature um, discloses God, but doesn't, the natural world, I don't think, exhausts God for Wordsworth. I think that's clear from many of his um, verses, particularly as he gets older. So God remains transcendent. And certainly in the case of Maltman, the very sentence I just quoted, where God is I dwelling in the world, you know, indwelling creation. Uh, Maltman also goes on to speak of God as the creator who redeems his creatures and leads them into the future of his kingdom. That clearly implies that nature doesn't exhaust God. Um, the God who indwells nature is also its transcendent creative source, its guide, its final goal. It's Alpha and Omega, as the um, book of the Apocalypse, Revelation, has it. Um, um, so, in some passages in God, Value and Nature, I think Fiona comes, uh, seems to retain a similar hankering for, for a transcendent dimension and she goes, she says God is not reducible to the world, and as she said um, in her remarks this afternoon, God is the world's, quote, ontological source, and as such is radically distinct from the world, despite being connected to it. And she goes on um, to insist, I think I'm quoting this right, nature is irreducibly open to God's communicative action where this is understood in terms of another quote from Fiona's book, the overall teleological aim, which is to turn nature towards its end in God. Uh, I think that's quite a remarkable thing for a naturalist, even of the expansive kind, to say. So I'm, I, I remain a little bit unclear exactly where Fiona stands <coughs> 
with regard to the ontological status and role of God. Um, in traditional mainstream theology, immanence and transcendence go hand in hand, two faces of the same coin. So Brad Gregory, divine transcendence is not the opposite, but the correlate of divine immanence. But I think there is this tendency to prioritize immanence in some modern thinkers to the point where uh, it occupies all the space. The notion of the presence of the divine is construed so radically that the transcendent disappears altogether. This is what I call radical immanentism. Now, Fiona has just distanced herself from this, but I think she sometimes is brought quite close to it by what she says. However that may be, uh, radical immanent, immanentism is, I think, very problematic, dispensing with the transcendent altogether. I'll just end by briefly mentioning two of the problems. The first stems from the notion of the divine realizing itself entirely in the unfolding processes of nature, because there is no other uh, process or realm. For the grim facts of nature surely just don't fit this, the idea of the divine enfolding in the actual processes of nature, unfolding. I mean, the, the fact is that the universe as a whole, including the Earth, uh, is a doomed vessel, inexorably condemned by the laws of physics to incineration, destined to a final end in the entropic heat death of the cosmos. Barring miraculous intervention from outside, which uh, both scientific naturalists and Ellis-style expansive naturalists rule out, um, this is the actual end, the actual telos towards ev which everything is almost certainly moving. So if you rely on this one world, this one world alone, what conceivable place in there is there in this model for nature to be turned ultimately towards God? the flow of nature of which we're a part can't be trusted to achieve our redemption. The second problem is that we can't expect redemption from nature in the sense of human nature, our own human nature, which is clearly flawed and conflicted. Human beings, in the immortal words of Bernard Williams, are to some degree a mess. Or as he says elsewhere, that we are an ill-assorted bricolage of powers and instincts. And despite all the efforts of contemporary ethicists like John McDowell and David Wiggins, whom Fiona referred to, the contingent twists and turns of social acculturation cannot, it seems to me, be trusted as a normative guide. All too often, as history shows, these turns, these contingent twists and turns, are very sinister twists and turns. Um, nor really can the underlying biology on which culture depends be d d relied on either. Even worse, regarding God as in the natural world, and hence in particular in us, uh, can easily, it's dangerous, it can pave the way for a hubristic post-Hegelian world picture where we humans see ourselves as the grand, supreme manifestation of the Weltgeist, um, taking control of history and in a certain way arrogating to ourselves quasi-divine status. The idea goes back to Genesis, the temptation, you shall be as gods, a key temptation of the serpent. Uh, and its philosophical antecedents, I think, are Immanuel Kant, who declared in his Opus Postumum, the unfinished work left at his death, uh, major work, God is not a substance outside myself, rather I, man, am this being myself. Um, now, that phrase has a pretty sinister ring, particularly for those who know C.S. Lewis's uh, no novel, That Hideous Strength. And some people have unkindly suggested that 
Kant was going gaga when he wrote that. But I think actually that's quite unfair. One can interpret um, Kant's comment in a benign way, not as extolling the arbitrary power of individual will, as the villains in C.S. Lewis do, but rather as pointing to something more universal, the rational will, so the evidence, the emphasis on rational rather than will. That's to say something universal in virtue of with which humanity is selbst gesetzgebend, giving the law to itself. But Kant's notion of self-legislation is deeply problematic in, in my view. Unless this rational element in us is a true instrument of transcendence, a phrase, striking phrase used by Nagel, interestingly, an atheist, unless that is an instrument of transcendence which he defines, Nagel defines as able to discern obje uh, objective independent moral value, then no decrees generated by the will can have the requisite moral authority. And it does seem to me all the various attempts by secular ethicists to try and cobble something together to defend self-legislation, whatever that can mean, um, such as Christine Koch, course guards attempt to uh, put self-constitution, you know, that's in the title of one of her most recent books, which self-constitute, constituting yourself is, quote, finding a role and fulfilling it with dedication. That seems to me to f fail to provide the requisite genuine moral normative authority. Really, all such attempts founder on the same rock which I began by suggesting shipwrecks Nietzsche. We can't generate meaning and value from our own resources. And I think this is, the, in the end, the strongest argument for the transcendent. Without the transcendent, then trying to, quote, constitute ourselves by reference to a self-chosen telos. So uh, self-constitution by reference to a self-chosen telos ends up without the transcendent as nothing more than pinning a gold star onto one subset of our conflicting desires and motives and instincts. I think Bernard Williams saw this clearly when he bit the bullet and said, in the post-theistic worldview, um, any normative reasons for action could only ultimately be what he called internal reasons. If we want authoritative reasons, and that means, I think, external reasons, if we want, as Fiona does, certainly if we want to preserve anything like traditional theism, as Fiona does, then it seems to me clear that we need, in Matthew Arnold's phrase, something not ourselves that makes for righteousness. The image and language of traditional theism keeps this firmly in view by envisaging a path to redemption that is through and through relational, premised on the I-thou confrontation. There's no room in that for Spinoza, in, no room for that in Spinoza. Uh, but that re relational confrontation is so prominent in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. It's an encounter with the holy, something utterly other, that draws us away from what we are, from the decaying flow of the world, and the confusion and weakness of our own nature, our own nature towards what we are not yet, but might become. The redemption that Nietzsche's arrow of our longing aspires to can only come about by striving to orient ourselves towards the transcendent, that presence that's beyond the reach of discursive knowledge, but which is glimpsed in our intimations of the divine in the world, and which calls us forward to the destination where our true peace and fulfillment
lies. 